Okay, we are interviewing Judge Gregory, who is running for re-election as municipal court judge. Uh, feel free to give us a, a two-minute introduction. All right, and good evening, everyone. My name is Judge Willie Gregory. I'm a Seattle Municipal Court judge. I'm the presiding judge, which means I'm the chief judge. I've been a presiding judge for two years now, and I've been a judge for about 11 years. Uh, my way to become a judge is kind of a securitous method. Uh, I was in the US Air Force and I was a security policeman. And I read um, the back of a Reader's Digest book about how to become a lawyer. And I read that and decided I was going to become a lawyer. So I got out of the Air Force, went to college, University of Arizona in Tucson, Arizona. And I came up uh, to the beautiful state of Washington to, be, to go to law school at University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington, which is now Seattle University. And um, while I was in law school, I actually, um, Worked at Evergreen Legal Services uh, as a law clerk, and I worked at um, Catholic Community Services, helping out as a paralegal uh, with uh, people who had um, different kind of legal issues that they needed handled. And after law school, I uh, became a public defender at Associated Counsel for the Accused, where I worked uh, for about 14 years as a staff attorney, as well as a supervising attorney in the Seattle Municipal Court Unit, the appellate unit of the misdemeanors, and um, the juvenile court unit. Uh, after that, I uh, went out on my own and had a solo practice, which I had for about eight years. And while um, having my solo practice, I visited different courtrooms and different courts. And a few of the judges would always ask me um, if I wanted to become a pro tem, a judge who covers for a judge when they're sick or on vacation. And so I became a pro tem judge and decided this is something I wanted to do, much like uh, reading the back of that Reader's Digest book. I decided I wanted to become a judge. And so I ran for a Seattle Municipal Court judge and I sought many endorsements and I got the endorsements of uh, judges, justices, attorneys, as well as uh, different LDs in the city of Seattle. And um, I wanted to become a judge because the one thing I wanted to do is I want to make sure that justice was served when people came before me and to make sure that people um, had an opportunity to make sure they were heard when they brought their cases before the court. 10 seconds left. Oh, good. Okay, thank you. And with the 10 seconds, I'll add uh, just a fun fact about me. I actually play ice hockey. I play on two ice hockey teams, and uh, I've been doing that for about 15, 20 years now, and I'm a very big Kraken fan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, very nice, very nice. So we have, um, we have four prepared questions. None of them are about hockey, but uh, we're going we're gonna to ask those to you, and you have two minutes to... Um, uh, uh, answer those. I'm going to start off with uh, Laura. Can you uh, answer, ask question number one? What are the elements of your background and experience that make you best qualified to earn our endorsement? Oh, okay. Uh, well, the elements of my background and experience is that uh, all of my time as an attorney and as a pro tem judge has been representing people. So I'm used to dealing with people and I'm used to treating people fairly and understanding the plight of what people go through in daily life. And so um, also um, I, um, I grew up in Chicago on the South side when I was a kid and boy, the things I used to see there growing up in Chicago uh, just, just steals me for understanding what people are going through. I've had um, relatives who's um, had substance abuse issues. So I understand them, people going through a substance abuse issue, people getting back on track and uh one of my family members who has substance abuse issues and has now gone to treatment and got in himself straightened out. So I understand that as well. And so I bring that to the bench as well as listener. When I was a security police, it was uh, really important that you listen when you're talking to people about uh, who has, um, you're accused of committing a crime or accused of, uh, in my case, I was uh, guarding airplanes, but if someone comes on the flight line. So it's very good to be a, list have, be a good listener and have patience when dealing with people. And the third thing that I bring is kindness. I understand that people will have uh, dealing with bad things before they come before me, but I try not to make sure that that person's, the reason that they're before me is not the worst day of their life, to make sure that they are, have an opportunity to make sure their case is heard before me. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, question number two, uh, Sarah, do you wanna give that one? Sure. Question number two, which is in the chat, is in what ways can the courts better serve those of moderate or low financial means in civil actions? Okay. okay. Well, I believe the best way is to make sure people have access to justice, which by that I mean to have access to an attorney. 
I know a lot of civil cases, people don't have access to an attorney, but in, I do primarily criminal cases and people have access to an attorney, either a public defender or if they um, can pay to hire an attorney. And I think in civil cases, that'd be helpful as well. If not that, then at least have more access to um, having attorneys to assist them while they're going through certain pleadings and certain uh, aspects of their case. So at least it'll be fair if they go into courtroom, they'll understand what's going on and what's happening in the courtroom. So I think that's a very, the most important thing is have a uh, legal assistance when you go inside of a courtroom, because if the other side has a, an attorney there, uh, it's gonna be very tough for a person to plead their case before a judge. So it's, again, it's very important to me that a person has access to justice by having a, a legal advocate with them when they go inside the courthouse. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, question number three, Sherry, do you want to take that? And again, these are in the chat. You can see the questions in the chat, but uh, Sherry, number three. Um, if presiding over a criminal docket, what role do you think judges should take and would you take, if any, in diverting defendants to diversion programs such as drug court, mental health court, or other diversion programs or other alternatives to incarceration? Okay. Let me take a look at this again here. It's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, initially, in presiding over a criminal docket, the, the role of the judge should take is be a neutral person. The judge shouldn't show any bias for either side. It should listen to both sides and make sure both sides have an opportunity to be heard. And to make sure if a, uh, either side wants the judge to review anything, give them that chance to review whatever they need to review. And to explain what's going on in the courthouse and what's going on with the, uh, the parties before you. And the other one is about uh, diverting defendants uh, to diversion programs. Well, I should tell you, when, um, as a judge, I've been involved in our mental health court. That was the first uh, court that I served in as a judge. I've also been involved in veterans treatment court, uh, which is a diversion program. Um, we, and I've done a uh, handled the domestic violence court, the general trial court, and, in, and I've also served in the community court. Uh, all of those basically diversion programs and seeking um, alternatives to incarceration. And in a lot of those plan, a lot of those programs, I will tell people say, if you have veterans, make sure you send them to the veterans treatment court so that we can help the person out. Or if a person, um, you know, uh, if they have other kind of issues, we can send them to community court. But usually what a judge can take is that a judge can bring up to the parties that if, you know, you may want to think about these other courts before you uh, have your client uh, take any other actions on their case. So a judge can take a lot of, uh, actions in doing that, uh, you can advise them, uh, maybe a good idea to take your client to uh, domestic violence intervention program, one of the uh, programs we had in connection with our DV cases. But uh, again, I think um, a judge, especially over presiding over the criminal docket, by still being an unbiased uh, person, you can still make sure people um, avail seconds. themselves of certain courts. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So I, I, I hate interrupting you, but I uh, would keep That's you okay. on track here. It's okay. Um, Barbara, you want to go ahead with number four? Thank you. Sure. Um, what is your position on bail reform? <clears throat> what factors do you or would you consider when deciding whether to impose bail and what changes would you advocate for if any if you are elected. And I understand that you have bail mm -hmm. guidelines. So this right. question is really about um, <coughs> uh, changes that you mm -hmm. advocate for. Okay, okay. Well, uh, <clears throat> I say um, in regards to this, uh, we do have, you're right, we do have um, court rules and revised code of Washington laws we have to apply and consider in, in order to set bail on someone or to release them. The one, number one thing is uh, the presumption with our court rules is for a person to be released. Now then when those other factors come into effect, we would look at whether or not a person's gonna show up back to court, if they're gonna commit any further violent acts or if they're gonna not comply with justice. So what you do is uh, you, look, you can look at a person's history. You can also definitely you should listen to what the parties say, uh, listen to what the defense and the prosecution say. And uh, the one thing you wanna make sure you do too is um, look at why the prosecution is asking for certain bail. Are they, are they asking for bail the same for everyone else? Or are they asking for certain, for people of color? Are they, ask, are they treating people differently when they're asking for the bail? And so there's ways and factors a judge can take into effect when he or she is looking at a case deciding whether or not to impose bail on someone. 
And something else we do at Seattle Municipal Court is we can, um, instead of putting somebody in jail while they're released, we can also think about electronic home monitoring. That way a person can be released and while release have be on electronic home monitoring, they can also remain employed and keep their housing. So there's a lot of um, different changes we can advocate for as a judge. And I have advocated for electronic home monitoring and, um, to the city, um, city council and gotten that what well, they've paid for the electronic home monitoring so we can uh, avail people of EHM as one of their release conditions in our cases. Thank you. So you have You're advocated welcome. for yes. bail situations. Bail Thank reform. you very much. You're welcome. Okay, so we are going to uh, ask you some questions just from the e-board. Reminder, you have one minute to answer these. Um, sure. Anybody want to go first? Will those be on chat? If I can get rid of this. I don't, but normally we've just been okay. asking them uh, oh, without fine. the chat. Um, Sarah, go ahead. So Judge, how would you define restorative justice and mm -hmm. how do you incorporate those principles into your work and judicial mm -hmm. decision making? Okay. But, um, I, I see restorative justice two ways. The way, one way I know it is um, getting victims and getting defendants together to kind of uh, talk about the effect that a person's crime has had on a victim. And I, I can actually, when you, you talk about that, and, um, I got asked this question before, but something I think about is when I was practicing as a public defender in juvenile court, there was a time where um, my client, who was about 14 or 15, has stolen uh, this woman's car. And at the time, um, and I really appreciate the prosecutors doing this. They were really trying to get victims to come in and really, you know, kind of talk to the kids about what's going on and what they did. And so the woman whose car my client has stolen, he was, uh, we were going through the sentencing phase and she was there and she spoke to my client. And basically what she did was she told him, said, I basically, I forgive you because I had sons and these, my sons had done things like this too. And it actually made my client really realize how, what he did really affected someone else. I mean, he broke down, he started crying. And the, the very cool thing about this is about a few weeks after that, I was walking up, going into the courthouse, and this, this kid yelled out, Willie, Willie. And I'm like, who's calling him? He's calling Willie. And I said, oh, I looked at him and I didn't even recognize him. And he told me, he said that that really affected him. And actually he was going in to see his probation officer. Are you still on probation? He goes, nope, I'm just going to say hi to my probation officer and let him know what I'm doing right now. And so that's how I would define it. But I also see it in the risk, the courts that we do too, the um, in veterans treatment court, community court. Sorry, it's one minute. Courts I, that we do, other courts that we do. I apologize, I got to cut you off. Um, uh, sure. Lori, Laura, another question. Can you tell us more about a uh, community court? Um, what who does that uh, court serve? Uh, community court serves uh, people with uh, offen lower offenses such as misdemeanors, theft property destruction, uh, criminal trespass cases. And what it does is a person, um, all you have to do is agree to um, maybe um, have a contact with a treatment agency, um, do community service. And if they do those things, um, the case will be continued for about, let's say 60 days. If they do what they're um, agreed to do, then the ca their case will be dismissed. And the one good thing about community court in Seattle is that they don't, the person does not have to give up any trial rights. In other words, they don't have to plead guilty and then have the case hanging over their head or say, for example, if you don't follow everything, then you'll have to just, the judge will read the police report and find you guilty of the offense. If a person doesn't comply with the agreement in community court, what will happen is they can still go to trial on the case. But it's really um, looking at the, the low level offenders and the offenses that they have. For example, you couldn't take a DUI case or a DV case in community court. Okay, thank you. Um, other questions? You're welcome. Sarah, you have a your hand up. I do, unless anyone else has a question. Um, okay, I'll just jump in. So you said you were the presiding judge, I believe, and I'm yes. sure there's a significant backlog of cases due to the pandemic, or there might not be, but um, if there are, what are you doing to address that and ensure access to justice? If not, what? how did you handle the pandemic and mm -hmm. did you develop any tools to kind of be right. more uh, efficient in terms of serving um, folks? Right. Well, I can tell you right now, gosh, I want to answer both of those. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will tell you, we do have a backlog. And what we tried to do, because actually the court is operating at about 75% of what we were operating at before the pandemic. 
And so what we're trying to do is get back to 100 and we have something called the road to 100 that we've uh, implemented in the court and we're doing whatever we, we're taking our time, but we're trying to get back to doing at least 100% of what we were uh, before the pandemic hit. But one thing is I want to actually get to the other part of the question because I'm pretty, I'm very proud of this is uh, we came up with a virtual court. People can appear uh, virtually in the court. Uh, by way of telephone or by video. So we started that very early in the game. And um, something else we had done at first, if a person wanted to come into court during that time period, but we were still closed, we'd let people come in and we'd let them go in the room with a computer, especially if they, a person didn't have access to a computer or to a phone, they could come in and still have their court hearing and be heard uh, by uh, going into that, what we called it was a computer lab. 10 seconds. We should have probably called it a computer courtroom, but that's what we called it. But we, we did many things as we could to make sure people had access to justice during that time period. And the court was, we were very lenient about not issuing warrants. If people didn't show up, that's especially, time. okay, when we had uh, given them other means in which to appear for their cases. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Um, we've got time for maybe one more question and then you have a minute closing okay, uh, sure. statement. Any, someone else? Uh, Clayton, you have a question. Um, I hope it's a question. Um, and I'm curious how your attitudes towards sentencing and diversion, diversionary courts um, change with changes in um, crime, uh, especially uh, downtown. Uh, because, you know, we have... It, mm -hmm. It comes and goes and goes up and goes down. And when it goes up, um, um, some people go nuts and right. some people don't. And so I, I just wondered how you think about that problem mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as an influence on your <laughs> larger okay. problems. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, like the one way I think about a lot of it is, um, what, what are we doing to make sure we're serving people and serving everyone? We're serving um, the person accused of the crime. We're serving the victims and the witnesses uh, that are involved in the case. But um, just to let you know, the one thing that judges do is we don't obviously um, pick, we don't file the cases to get into the courthouse as the prosecutors. And of course, we don't arrest the people, the police officers. And so we don't really have nothing to do with the cases until they come into the courtroom. Now, yeah. what, I can't, what I can do is when a person is before me to be sentenced, you know, I can give, you know, look at sentences that'll help that person out and do as much as we can to make sure the person doesn't come back again into the courtroom. And, you know, that's, and a judge, we don't have to follow sentences by the prosecutor or by defense. We can craft the sentence yeah, that'll help the person before us. And so that's something we can take into consideration as well. And what I like to do sometimes too is actually talk to the people, especially the younger, and find out what's the person's story, what's going yeah. on, what brought the person before me. Mm. And that, that's what's good about the when I saw about the other courts that we do is that the judge is really a part of the team with the person. And a lot of times the person. Um, oh, <laughs> right. that's I okay. apologize, Judge Gregory. <laughs> um, we got time for you to make your closing statement, and uh, sure. I want to thank you again for answering these questions. And even if we had, to, if I had occasionally uh, put the stopwatch on it, but well, thank you. And uh, first thing I want to do is I want to thank you all for uh, interviewing me this evening. I, I know you're all volunteers. I appreciate all, all that. And I think my wife has done that before. She was a PCO, so I understand all of your hard work. <laughs> but uh, again, I'm Willie Gregory, and I'm running um, to retain my position, which is seat num position number five in Seattle Municipal Court. Uh, I'm the presiding judge in Seattle Municipal Court, which means that I do um, the administrative duties of the court as well as uh, my uh, criminal case load of criminal cases. Um, I love being a judge because uh, number one, you get to help people and you get to um, really listen to what brought people before you and you get to do what you can to make sure that people have an avenue to be better when they leave the courtroom than when they came into the courtroom. And one thing about being a judge too, you're constantly learning. You have to be willing to learn because there's so many things that come before us and there's so many people that come before you. And you, know, you have to remember that you are dealing with people and you're dealing with certain issues that people have. And so one thing that's important to me is that I listen to people that have compassion with them and kindness. And uh, kind of the answer some part of Clayton's question too, I believe that a judge can adhere to uh, community safety as well as kindness and compassion. 
And by that, it's, it's the way in which you craft your sentence. It's the way in which you treat the person before you. And there's no, we can also let person, people be aware about what they did and how that had an effect on society and, and on the community in front of them. So again, thank you. And I hope you all have a good night. Thank you so much. I'm going to stop You're the welcome. recording.